Cool, so hey, um, I'm Kirk, um, security lead at Snapper. I've met some of you before. Um, today, um, we're gonna talk about the OWASP top 10 and have a few examples in PHP of how it works. Um, the OWASP top 10 is the top 10 security issues um, sort of ranked by prevalence and impact. Um, it's hard to go into depth into all of them in 45 minutes. So some of them I'm gonna go briefly and some of them I'm gonna go deeper. Um, so first off, uh, here's the table of contents for today. Um, pretty much what, uh, what we said, plus a little bit of a uh, rant at the end about choosing good frameworks. Um, I recycled some old Taylor Swift on security memes, um, so I hope you find them amusing. Um, it's a great Twitter account, Swift on Security, that you should follow. Cool, so what is OWASP? So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and it's a community-driven, uh, basically knowledge base and wiki, um, all around web security and issues in web security. It's been going for longer than 10 years, and the flagship project on the OWASP, uh, under the OWASP name is the top 10, which is what we're covering today. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the OWASP website, and I find it's really easy to get lost in the depth because um, it's a wiki, so there's you know just heaps of content. Um, they have uh, projects for different programming languages. They have um, testing tools. They have standards. They have um, different guidelines on how you might test for web security issues. But there's just tons of stuff on there. Um, but pretty much, if you just go to the OWASP uh, website, um, and up the top there in the area I've highlighted yellow are the kind of the best bits, I reckon, um, and top ten is linked from there. Um, and what the top 10 is, is the list, as I said, the top 10 um, security issues. So obviously this isn't every security issue your app could have. Um, you probably want to test for the 11th and the 12th thing as well. Uh, but it's, uh, the, the idea is that um, through research uh, collaboration between a whole lot of people from different companies, they have pulled together like incident counts. So you know, how many hacking incidents were caused by different issues. Um, they've looked at the severity of the issues, so you know, does this attack lead to your entire business going under, all the data of all your users being exposed, or is it more minor? Um, and they've kind of ranked them um, in the top 10. The version I'll be going through today is the 2013 version, which is, um, there's a 2017 version underway at the moment, um, and each version kind of juggles around the order slightly or clarifies some of them but the main kind of ideas are the same. So that's the top 10, that's what we're gonna run through. Um, so first off, before we start, let's talk about the threat model. Uh, so here's a very simple diagram of a gender neutral person uh, using a laptop with no keyboards, accessing a server from the 1960s. Um, and so if your website's running on the web server um, and a user's using it, what are the different ways that they can be attacked? Well, first off, we normally talk about the user as the victim, um, and we have the attacker who's trying to do something. Uh, so the attacker can attack the server directly, um, so that's like looking for open ports or out-of-date software, things like that. Um, they can try and look at data as it transfers from the user's browser to the server and back again, a so-called man in the middle. Um, they can log into your web app or use that web app um, and try and misuse some functionality in the web app. Um, they can try and trick the victim into going somewhere else. So while they're using your website, they trick them to go to another website. Um, or they can get the victim to run code in their own web browser. Um, so as you can see, like these attacks basically cover every component and every place where data flows between those components. Um, and that's the typical approach we take when we're threat modeling something is to think about what are the different components? How does data transfer between them? Um, and turns out that each one of those arrows is a different top 10 threat. Um, each one of those flows. Cool, so here's the list of the top 10. Um, wow, let's go to the first one. Um, so the first one is injection. So you might have heard of SQL injection. Um, this is when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter. So when 
something that the user passes in, like it's put into a string, and then that's passed to an interpreter, and the computer runs it as a command or a query. So here are some examples of interpreters where um, there's a string on the left-hand side, and then the computer interprets it and runs a command. So you've probably seen SQL a few times. Um, so that string causes this, the, the SQL server to run a query. Um, the command prompt will you know, run the dir command. Um, LDAP objects, that's actually an LDAP search query that will look for any objects with given name as John. And then um, XPath will let you search through XML documents. So they all have different syntax, but the basic idea is that you know, um, there's a string and, uh, and it's causing the computer to run something. So um, let's look at how these can go wrong. So what happens if your app is asking the user for the directory name um, that uh, they should get a directory listing for? Um, and instead of typing in C colon backslash, they type in semicolon format C colon slash Q slash U. Uh, that would be bad. Um, that would format the hard drive. And because the computer's just running whatever command it gets given, um, it'll see the semicolon and go, oh, they're giving me two commands. I'll run one after the other. Um, likewise for LDAP, you might want them to just query for um, a person by first name, but if someone types in a first name that's not just a word, um, then they can add an all clause um, to the LDAP query and search for all users. Um, same with SQL. This is the one you would have seen, SQL injection. Um, this SQL statement on the left would normally return two columns, say first name and last name, or um, name and uh, user ID, or something like that. But if we union the results of that with another select statement that also returns two columns, then the application will return result set that's you know twice as long, um, as long as the two things are the same shape. Uh, so, so what we got from that is basically um, user input shouldn't be trusted um, because if you just chuck it into a SQL query or a command prompt um, or LDAP query or whatever, the computer's just going to run it. So let's do a demo. So for these demos, I'm using a, um, a website called Damn Vulnerable Web App. Um, it's an instructional PHP MySQL web application, which I've just installed on a Linux VM. Um, you can download it and install it. It's got instructions for um, all the operating systems um, and use it to teach yourself about security things. Um, and it comes with some kind of instructions, but it also has secondary purposes to use for training. Um, so um, pretty much each of the different attacks has a different section in the app. So, First off, we're going to look at SQL injection. So this is a really simple application. Um, when I type in a user ID, um, it's going to look up the user from the database. So I type in user ID 1, I see the admin user. 2, I see Gordon Brown. 3, I see Hack Me. 4, I see Pablo Picasso. So the first thing you do when you're wondering if an application has SQL injection um, is you try putting a single quote in there. because in SQL single quotes end strings, and so if this, the server is expecting me to enter a string in there, I might be able to end that string and do something else. Um, and you'll see that the application is given back an error message uh, that says I've got an error in my syntax, um, and then it helpfully on the right hand side um, tells me the part of my SQL statement that I've got wrong and where the error is. Um, so now we know that the user's input is being passed right through to the database engine and the database engine is like running that input um, as a command. Um, now we can try some different attacks. So a simple one is just to go um, wildcard the, um, the initial value. So in my head what I'm thinking is they're probably putting the number one or the number four inside single quotes. Um, so I'm going to put a percent on the end of the first single quote that was supposed to precede my value and close that string and then put an all one equals one and that'll probably that should evaluate to true and then every string in the every row in the database should get returned um, and that indeed happens so um, the code there has just returned every row in the database because the, the second half of the um, where clause evaluated to true 
So you can do more advanced stuff. Um, so MySQL has a whole bunch of um, additional tables that you can select stuff out that describe the database structure and who the users are. Um, if you know names of other databases, you could potentially put them in. So let's do a, a simple one. Um, bleh, pressed enter. Um, so let's do our first query and then union it with another query. Um, so I happen to know that this is returning two, two columns as the results. Um, so I'll just put null as my first column um, and table name as my second column. Um, and there's a schema in MySQL called information underscore schema. Um, and so if I'm lucky, um, this should return uh, the names of all the tables in the database. Uh, did I forget select? Damn it. Um, and so, yeah, so there's a table called guest book, a table called users, a table called all plugins, applicable roles. And that's gone through, and that's given me a lot of information about how the database works. Um, what I could do is, um, is try and figure out the names of um, columns in the database. I could do that by looking in that information schema. Um, or I could even do it um, using guesswork. So um, is, there any column, is there any column names that are greater than F? Okay, there is. How about greater than L? Okay, so there's column names that start with something higher than L do like a binary search for the first letter and then the next letter and the next letter until you can build up the whole structure of the database. Um, that's quite laborious if you do it yourself, uh, but luckily someone else has done it for us. Um, pop up little window. Why is that not opening? Uh, anyone know how to Linux? Oh. Is my window not recyclable? Where's my terminal window gone? Oh well, it's that new one. Uh, oops, wrong operating system. I've got terminals inside terminals. Okay, so there's this tool called um, SQL Map. Um, so uh, it's a Python application um, and what that does is it'll enumerate um, one page or one field that has an error, um, a SQL injection issue, and then figure out what it can do. Um, so I have actually prepared a command line for it earlier because I knew I'd get it wrong. Um, so what this command line is doing is um, running SQL map pointing it at the URL of that page that had the issue um, and passing in the cookie of me as the logged in user. Um, and now it's going to try and do a lot of different requests to that page to figure out stuff. Uh, so the first thing it's doing is figuring out um, uh, what database engine it is. So it's decided that the ID parameter is vulnerable to SQL injection, um, which is right, um, and that the backend database is MySQL, which is also right. Um, now it's going to um, run a whole bunch of different tests for the MySQL database. Um, so you can see, as this is running, it's actually running <coughs> heaps of different requests against the web server. Um, it's figuring out what version of MySQL it is, um, based on them returning slightly different error messages and having different tables in their schema. Um, it's figured out, oh yeah, the ID parameter is vulnerable. Do we want to look for other parameters? No, we'll just stick with ID. Um, and then it returned um, all the databases and the tables inside them. So that's pretty cool because that's not just the database my website was using, which was that little one that only had two tables. It's also other databases on the server that the website could access if it wanted because its query string has permissions to those databases. Um, so, you know, sort of moving sideways from the web database to maybe something more sensitive. Um, so it's found the tables, so that's, that's cool. Um, you can also do more interesting stuff. You can dump the users on the database. Um, so this is doing the same thing, um, and it can crack their um, passwords using a dictionary. Uh, so just use the default one. 
Um, and so that's looked at the in the MySQL, there's a password column for each of your database users, and there's a hash, and now it's trying to brute force what the passwords actually are for those users. Um, so it's figured out ABC123, Charlie, um, don't know how long this will take um, for each of the users. Let me in, that's a good one. Um, so I might stop that because that will take a while. Um, and you can also dump the tables. So um, I think it's dump tables. Or is it just dump? Um, and what this will do is now go through um, every table <coughs> and fetch every comment, uh, every row and every comma, column. So uh, it's only doing it on the current database at the moment. But here it's got a bunch of rows from the users table in this application and the comments table. Um, but you get to run over everything. I think it's dump all. Yeah, so now it's doing it across all the other tables and all the other databases. Um, so this is a pretty serious issue if your app has um, SQL injection. You see how it was just like one field on one page in the application that lets a tool like this download your entire database. Um, that's not a good thing. Like this is the sort of thing that's brought um, like the Sony PlayStation Network down a few years ago. Um, a lot of the kind of hacking and dumping of data online um, has been through SQL injection, where you know through one field in LinkedIn or MySpace or whatever the app was. Um, they were able to download the whole database um, onto their own computer and then use that to breach the security. Um, I'm going to cancel that. Um, another one which is kind of fun is um, it turns out that MySQL uh, can manipulate files on the operating system if it has permissions. Um, and so this OS shell command, um, you can choose which language you think the, the server runs and where the website is, which on... Um, LAMP is this location, um, but it can guess it itself. Um, ooh, that didn't work. Did I get the path wrong? Alt. L A M P P. Cool. Um, so, what that's done now is it's uploaded a PHP file to my website. Um, MySQL actually wrote it into the website's directory for me. Very nice of it. Um, and now um, the SQL map tool, every time I type a command in here, um, it'll send it to that PHP app, a PHP page, which will run the command and then send back the results. Um, so I just did directory listing, so that's showing all the files in that directory. Um, you know, you could look in uh, maybe more sensitive directories. Um, maybe I could make a folder, um, Kirk's a good name, I think. Um, copy some sensitive file into that folder um, and now when I go back to my website um, which is localhost there'll be a folder called Kirk with a file called password in it which has like the etc password file um, so yeah it's amazing what MySQL will let you do um, so it's all around you know what permissions are you using on your database um, can it upload files that sort of thing um, yeah, I think you can just run cat as well. Cool. So, yeah. Um, and then, of course, you can maybe run a shell that connects back to your own server so that you can keep doing stuff from home without it showing up on their logs. Cool. So that's uh, SQL injection. You can see why that's ranked as number one, uh, because it lets you download an entire database um, and anything it's connected to. And sometimes companies will have databases linked together, you know, like for re replication or maybe an external database gets a feed from an internal one, and so potentially you can follow those links. Um, also, you might be able to get access to add users to the operating system, you know, turn on firewall rules to allow someone to remote desktop in, that sort of thing. So there's that tool, SQL map. Um, so that just summarizes what happened in the SQL injection there. Um, the last three bullet points are what you should do about it. Uh, so parameterizing your queries, using store procedures, and perhaps escaping user input. I'll just show you what they did wrong in that web app. So the nice thing about damn vulnerable web app is um, it comes with 
the, uh, the bad source code um, and then shows you good or better source code as an example. Uh, so in here, when it was taking the ID, it was getting it straight off uh, the query string or out of the form um, and just shoving it into the middle of a string. So it's not being checked to see if it has single quotes or you know, union statements or semicolons or anything. Um, it's just getting put straight in the query string um, and then that query is being run. Um, so what should you do instead? Well, it's different in every language, but normally it looks something like this. Um, instead of putting the variable in the middle of the query string, you put a parameter in there. So here, the syntax for this library is you put uh, colon ID, where ID is the name of the parameter, or colon name or whatever. Um, other ones, it's question mark. Depends on the database engine and library you're using. Um, and then later on, you bind the parameter. So the value that came from the user, um, this is saying it can only be an int, and it's being bound to that parameter in there. And then the database engine gets the, the command, the SQL query, separate from the data, which is the information to shove into the parameters. Um, they're also doing some other checks that are kind of nice. They're checking to make sure that the ID is actually numeric, um, which would have stopped a bunch of those um, strings from working. Um, and they're also making sure that only one row is returned, because if you're searching for one user and you get a thousand rows, that's probably bad. Cool. So, uh, what else have we got on the slide? Um, so, in PHP, as I was saying, there's another way of um, parameterizing your query with question marks and then binding the parameters. Uh, different PHP libraries abstract this way in, in different ways. So, Laravel um, has an ORM where you like create construct a user class, um, and then when you want to do queries, you use a special language. Um, to do the queries in rather than writing the raw SQL yourself, and then they can make sure it's safe. Uh, similarly in Symfony, which is another PHP framework, um, they use an ORM that generates some code for you, and so you can use their methods like find a product by name, whoa, I just went way forward, um, find a product by name um, and um, pass in the name of the product you want to look up, and it'll make sure it's safe to run, um, and if you even need to create a query by hand, um, they've got a query builder class that will help you do that. Cool. Uh, so, number two. Uh, number two is broken auth and session management. So this is when uh, you can gain access to someone else's account. This is also not a good thing. Uh, so just a brief refresher of how web apps work. So each time your browser connects to a web server and asks for something like an HTML page or an image um, or a movie or anything, it's a completely separate request and the web server remembers nothing about you. It doesn't keep any state around who all the current users are. Um, so it's not like a traditional kind of socket programming where you know open a socket and you're sending data backwards and forwards where you only have to check who the user is when you open the socket. With a web app you have to check at every single request to see who they are. Um, and the typical way that they'll remember who you are is by cookies. So the normal flow is like you create an account on the site and they store your username and password somehow on their site securely. Um, and then as you're browsing around, there's a cookie that keeps track of your session state. So maybe what you've added to your shopping cart. And there might be another cookie that keeps track of who you are when you're logged in. Um, and then other things in the app, like changing your password or whatever, they'll check to make sure you're logged in and then run their application logic. So there's a bunch of issues that kind of are under this umbrella of, um, of the number two. Um, so, you know, when people are signing up to the site, you might be storing their passwords insecurely, um, either just storing the plain text of their password, which would be really bad, because if someone managed to dump your database, they get all the users' passwords, easy to read. Um, so normally you'd hash them, um, but you might be doing that weekly, um, so using MD5 or an unsalted hash. Um, I can't go into that too deeply, but um, but yeah, you want to make sure you're storing the passwords correctly. Um, there can be issues with the cookies, so someone could steal a cookie, someone could guess what the cookie should be, um, or the actual logic around logging in could be flawed. Um, so there's been applications where, you know, accidentally for a few hours, you could log in with a username and any password, because someone made a mistake when they're making the login page. Um, and so that's kind of all wrapped up under this this category of issues. 
Um, so just uh, how would you go about stealing a cookie? Well, one easy way is for your um, gender neutral attacker um, to be watching the traffic of the gen gender neutral user with a keyboard with no keys um, and just grab the cookie. So this might be in an internet cafe where everyone's using um, unencrypted Wi-Fi. You can just watch everyone else's traffic and if you see them log in, you can grab the cookie um, that they get given. It might be someone that owns or has taken control of a router or network cable or something in between the user and the web server. Um, so typically we combat that with encryption, but we'll talk about that later. Um, once the attacker's got a cookie, they can use it. Um, and yeah, they will be very happy. So I'm not going to go into too much about that one um, because I'm going to go into more into the next one. Uh, so the third issue is cross-site scripting. So hopefully you've heard of that one. Um, and um, this is kind of a bit like the SQL injection where um, you're, in, you're interleaving your commands uh, with the data. And what I mean by that is when a web server sends an HTML page to a user's browser, that page is a command for the browser. It says, I want you to render this page with tables and divs and spans and all this other kind of stuff. Here are the colors I want you to use in CSS. I want you to put these buttons in these places. And the browser says, OK, I'll run that command set and run it. Um, also, you can put in JavaScript, which is more commands for the user's browser you know, to do interactive stuff. Um, so uh, so here's, a, here's a really sophisticated modern web page written in HTML2. Um, so uh, you can see that the web server sent uh, this to the browser, and the browser is probably just going to print out high kirk and black text on a white background. Um, so um, let's say the user is able to enter their own name, and the web server sends back to the browser that user's name um, and says hello to them. Um, so in PHP, you might do it like this. Um, you might have a variable in your code um, inside the user object. Um, and just let that out into the HTML. When the browser gets that, it'll just display the user's name um, in there. Um, but what happens if the user signs up and enters their name with a JavaScript tag, uh, um, with a script tag with some JavaScript inside it? Um, the browser's going to get that script tag and go, well, the server told me to run this JavaScript. I better run it. Um, because the page it received looks something like this, which looks just like a normal web page with some script that it needs to run. Um, so the problem with cross-site scripting really is when an attacker or someone who's not the real user, um, no, the problem with cross-site scripting is when an attacker gets to send commands to a user's browser rather than you, the owner of the website. Um, because you want to tell them how this page should run and you don't really want other people doing that for you. Um, so this is an example of controlling the user's computer. Um, so if I'm an attacker and I can put a string into the web server that it sends back to other users and then runs as JavaScript, that JavaScript will run as that user. Uh, so let's do a, a quick demo of cross-site scripting. This is a pretty small demo. Um, cross-site scripting can take up a talk, um, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, so you might guess that the damn vulnerable web app is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Um, so this is basically that page that I just showed you. Like you put your name in, you submit it, and it says hello to you. Um, and the way I normally test for XSS is just try putting in a, a less than sign and see if the page looks weird. Um, strangely enough, this page looks fine. Um, so let's try putting in a script tag. Um, and the canonical one is a script alert one. Um, it's kind of like uh, the shortest JavaScript you can run that does something. It really doesn't want me to type it today. Um, so um, that JavaScript ran, so this, this website is basically vulnerable to any JavaScript that I typed in there would probably run just as easy as that alert one statement. Um, and if you look at the web page um, at this point, you'll see where it was supposed to be putting the name, it's actually got a script tag. So like that example on the slides. Um, so what can we do with cross-site scripting? Well, most people when first confronted with this issue, we'll go, that doesn't matter if alert boxes pop up for users occasionally, that's not going to hurt them. Um, they can just click OK and they'll go away. 
Um, and luckily there's like 15 years of, um, hey, what's the worst thing that could happen with cross-site scripting kind of uh, research being done. Um, and it turns out a lot of stuff can be done because pretty much the JavaScript can do anything that your app could do on that user's browser. Um, so um, you could use the JavaScript to proxy commands through the user. So maybe attack some other website and it will look like it came from their computer. Um, you could trick them into performing something like entering their password. Um, you could redirect them to a fake login page. You could redirect them to malware. Um, basically anything the user could do themselves, you can do once you're able to run JavaScript. Um, so there's a cool project called Beef. Um, I don't, this is a really fun one to show in demos, but I don't have time to demo it in this talk. Um, what Beef is, um, is a um, exploitation kit to um, do stuff to people when they visit websites that have XSS on them. So you put a small bit of JavaScript into a website um, that uh, tells their computer to connect back to a Beef control, com control server. Um, each of the users show up as a hooked browser, um, and uh, so that's basically the list of victims. Um, and then Beef has a bunch of commands that you can get to run automatically or manually run in that user's browser. So their browser basically says to Beef, tell me what to do, 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 and Beef will eventually tell them something to do. Um, and Beef has a bunch of modules built in that can do all kinds of really bad stuff. Um, so, so some of the more benign stuff, like figuring out what browser they've got, detecting if they've got ActiveX, uh, playing a MIDI file or some kind of sound, uh, like it's 1995 again. Um, uh, view their webcam, so using Flash you can turn on a person's webcam. Um, probably they'll have to click OK, but they might trust the website they're on and think, oh yeah, um, my bank is asking me to turn on my webcam, click OK, so it's actually, <laughs> they probably wouldn't click OK. Um, deface the website, um, steal the cookies, steal bits of information about the page, um, crawl the rest of the website as that user. So if you tricked an administrator, or if you managed to get cross-site scripting running on the administrator's browser, maybe you could crawl right through the HR system as them, looking at how much everyone gets paid, um, if, if that was your thing. Um, you can redirect them to a Rick roll. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's some malicious Chrome extensions you can try and trick them into installing, um, some specific things for cameras and different frameworks. Um, you could, from their computer inside their house, um, scan and see if there is a router listening, say on 192.168.1.1, and if it's a Linksys or a D-Link, uh, maybe you can send some posts to it to change its password. Um, and those ones are all ones that have had issues. And it, have been nicely written up. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, the list is endless. You can do so many crazy things. Um, and um, oh, this is my favorite one. This is the one where you um, get Clippy to run. Um, <laughs> so when they're on the web page, um, it pops up with the Clippy and it tells them what to do. Yeah. Cool. So um, the summary of that is like, even though cross site scripting seems small, it can turn into something reasonably big. Um, the flip side is that most websites, maybe every website in existence has had cross-site scripting at some point and it's really hard to stamp it out from everywhere. So it takes a lot of diligence to try and stamp out all the places. Um, and the way you fix it, well the first way is the easiest, <laughs> might not be that profitable, is to never ask users for input and never display what they tell you. Um, and so like brochureware websites where you know you just have like the marketing page for a company probably don't have cross-site scripting issues because the user never enters any information. Um, there's some other defenses so the primary one is to encode all the output that the user supplies to turn it from a command which can have angle brackets in it, uh, less than, greater than, um, into just text. Um, so I'll show you that in a sec. Um, you could whitelist all the data they're allowed to enter, so maybe they're entering their name, you only allow them to enter A through Z, um, and then Mr. O'Flaherty gets annoyed, as well as that guy from China who just signed up to your app, so then you maybe have a bigger whitelist. Um, 
And the kind of ultimate defense is content security policy, which is really good if you're starting a new app. And this is where the web server tells the browser, this is how my JavaScript works. Um, if you get anything that doesn't work this way, then don't run it. And the browser kind of enforces that rule. Um, that's also another talk on its own. It's quite hard to get right, but the best time to do it is when you're starting a project that's a lot harder to retrofit. Um, so how do you do this in some frameworks? Well, Laravel and Symfony both use the double curly brackets sort of um, Angular style templating language where when you want to output a variable, you put dollar and then the variable's names inside those curly brackets. Um, and what that does is it runs an HTML encode which turns the command, the script tag, into something that's just printable text, ampersand LT semicolon. Um, and that's basically how you make it safe. Uh, some frameworks will also have like an OO or object way of constructing elements on your page where you, you know, you're making instances of objects and setting properties rather than just manipulating text manually. Um, and that's also a nice way to stop making mistakes because you just write the label class once and then everywhere you want to put a label, you know it's going to be safe. Um, but it's not as easy as that, unfortunately. Um, so it turns out there's at least five different ways that um, a web page can display some data or can have data. Um, and the rules are different for each way. So the one we were talking about was an HTML element. So we're putting something in the body of a page. And so in that case, dangerous things are greater than and less than, and maybe uh, some other characters. And so you typically use a library called HTML encode um, to make that safe. Um, but if you're putting the user's text in an attribute, um, like on this input tag, um, then there's different rules about what makes a safe attribute. Because if they put a single quote in there, um, they will end um, type equals single quote something and they'll start another attribute which could be you know like on click equals and then some JavaScript or um, on error equals. Um, there's different rules inside JavaScript so JavaScript has its own rules around what valid syntax is and isn't. Um, so single quotes are probably going to be dangerous in there. Maybe double quotes depending on how you write your JavaScript. Um, CSS has other rules it turns out you can actually run JavaScript from inside CSS um, and Internet Explorer old versions um, and URLs have yet another set of rules. So when you've got this bit of data like a person's name, you have to know where you're going to use it and make it safe for each situation, which is a real drag. Um, and um, sort of there could be more um, different ways you display data like you might have SVG inside your page or um, I don't know, something else, Flash or whatever. Um, so it's quite a burden on the developer to, to know, hey, this bit of data I don't trust, everywhere I use it, I have to treat it in a different way. Um, the other thing that comes into play is that these different content types of context nest. So you've got a script tag inside a div, which is inside an HTML body tag. So you've got JavaScript encoding there and you've got um, HTML encoding and so you need to make sure you do them in the right order because if you have inside a JavaScript string if it just says close script tag you know angle bracket uh, slash script um, it doesn't really matter if that JavaScript is syntactically correct the browser is parsing the HTML first um, so you can end up having to encode things three times um, or if you've got JSON inside JavaScript inside HTML or if it, yeah it's just nuts uh, so the recommendation um, from some people is to try and avoid this um, by not putting user entered data um, into too many different types of places. So maybe only let user entered data go in HTML elements and attributes and just say we never put user entered data in our JavaScript or our CSS or on the end of URL. Um, and then that at least narrows it down to just two things you have to worry about. Um, there's a cheat sheet on the OWASP site that you could have a look at for more info. Cool, so that wraps up cross-site scripting. Um, like I said, that's really prevalent um, and affects a lot of web apps. And you know, there's a high cognitive load on the developer to try and pr protect against that. Um, number four is insecure direct object references. And this is a bit of a mouthful, um, but it's basically changing references to something um, to see something you're not supposed to see. 
So maybe the app lets you look at files, maybe you can change the file name, or it lets you look at item one in the database. If you change it to item three, you see someone else's data. Um, and this has happened before. There was an Australian bank where um, in the URL it had your credit card account number, and if you change that, you saw someone else's credit card details, um, which is pretty major. Um, but you know, like lots of apps have this issue as well because they're not double checking that the current user is allowed to see something. Um, so there's some different examples. We often see things that generate PDFs or some of the files system. And if you change the change the name, you can see someone else's PDF description. Um, um, or maybe you can change the change the name to the 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 uh, so, so, so this is a very similar demo. demo. Um, I really should, should say should slow my time a little, little bit longer. Um, um, so, so um, in this app, uh, they use a template where, where they want the outside of the page to be the same for everyone, um, and just have like different snippets inside that middle rectangle. Um, and the way they're referring to those snippets is um, each snippet has a, a different PHP file and they're embedding it in the middle of the page um, and they're passing the name of the PHP file in the URL. Um, so I'm on file 3 but like if I change it to file 1 I see that file embedded. Um, so our theory is probably we can embed anything um, inside there. Like maybe we could look at the HD access file um, which would be on a Linux server. Oh there's no such file or directory. Hey, really nicely, the error message tells us the path. Um, so we could go look in different directories. So dot dot slash goes up a level. Um, just do this a bunch of times till we probably get to the top of the web server. Um, and now we can look at you know, things like et cetera password or um, basically anything the web server can access, uh, we can access um, if we know its file name or we can guess its file name. And helpfully, it'll give us messages saying if the file doesn't exist. Um, so yeah, what, what did they do wrong in this app? Um, well, basically, they're just taking the page name off the URL and just going straight to it. Um, so they're just taking page equals blah off the URL and then opening that file. If they want to do it slightly safer, I mean, one way would be to have a better web framework that has a better templating library. Um, but say you want, you're stuck with this, is to have a whitelist of the safe values that are allowed. Um, so in this web app, there's only four pages that you should ever embed inside that rectangle, include file one, file two, file three. Um, so this whitelist just says, if it's not any of those, then throw an error. Um, that's, that's one good way of doing it. The nice thing about whitelists is that um, by default, you're blocking everything, and then you're only allowing a few things. Um, sometimes developers will get given a result that said, you know, you can go to etc. a password and look at it, and they'll go, I know what I'll do, I'll blacklist the word password. Um, and so they can never go to slash etc slash password. But the problem with a blacklist is you can try other things, and if they're not on the blacklist, they'll still work. So there might be some other sensitive files on the server. Cool. So how do you protect against insecure direct object references? Um, well, the main way is kind of just an overarching web security philosophy, which is don't trust anything. Um, so be paranoid about any data that you receive from the user's browser. So what they've typed in, the URL, cookies, headers, everything that you receive, you should assume is possibly malicious. Um, Another approach, which is, there's an OWASP project called ESAPI. I'm not sure if it's ready for prime time for your programming language. You could go have a look. But it's got some nice ideas in there. One of them is that um, when John goes to visit um, this database record, say his credit card, um, he gets the ID, like, oh, so the credit card's in the database with ID 1. When he goes to visit it, and his browser, it's like FZQH. But when his wife goes to look at it, um, her URL is like ABC3 or something like that. So each user is given a different ID um, for the one record in the database. Um, and the web server keeps a mapping of, you know, for the user John, this ID is valid and goes to this place in the database. So if someone 
steals his ID or guesses his ID, it won't work because they're not logged in as John. Um, and you know you can make them random and hard to guess. Um, and you would also get alerts potentially if someone's trying to do this. Um, I've seen banking, online banking, do this. So you know the URL when I log into my internet banking is different than when my wife does, even though we're looking at the same bank account. And when I log out and log back in again, the same bank account has a different URL. And that's because they're generating temporary keys to point to the same bank account. Uh, another approach is to validate the input. So this is a pretty common um, recommendation is, you know, if the IDs are only supposed to be numbers, then don't let them enter letters. Um, and also verify that the user is allowed to access it. So every single place you load stuff from the database um, or every single entry point into your website, you need to check that the user's logged in and they're the right user to see that data. Cool, so that's insecure direct object references. Wow, this is going slower than I expected. Um, so security misconfiguration, um, this is pretty basic. This is what we think about when we talk about web server security, which is like the web server is old and it's been plugged in for 10 years and never rebooted. It's probably running like, I don't know, Windows 3 or something like that. Um, and everything's out of date. Um, and the basic principle here is that you want everything to be as hardened as possible at every layer in your system. So you want every step of the way from you know the operating system to the web server software like Apache to the app server you might be running like Jetty to your application code, any libraries that you use and the database all to be up to date um, and all to be locked down as much as possible because an attacker has to get past every one of these defenses to get access to the data in your database. You need to put as many layers of defense as possible. Yeah, cool picture. Um, so that was fast. Um, so n number six is sensitive data exposure. Um, and uh, there's lots of different ways that data could be exposed that, that shouldn't be. Um, but I'm just going to primarily just talk about encryption. Um, so like that scenario of someone sitting in, a, in an internet ca cafe watching everyone else's traffic. Um, if there's no encryption on this uh, communication between the user's browser and the web server they're going to, anyone can watch the traffic going past. Um, but if you've got HTTPS on your website, then the traffic will be encrypted and a lot harder for someone to see. If they're using a, um, an encrypted Wi-Fi connection, you know, uh, WPA2 or something like that, um, then the Wi-Fi connection will be encrypted as well. Um, so the way you protect your data is to only collect what you need. So if you don't need pe people's, I don't know, blood type, marital status and stuff, don't ask them for it. That way you've got less stuff to collect, uh, less stuff to protect. Um, transfer, transmit it securely, like encrypt it and store it securely. So maybe you need to encrypt your database in case someone gets onto that server. Um, don't invent your own encryption algorithms, even though it might be fun for a university project. Um, chances are it's not actually going to be secure. Um, the main ones we use like um, you know, RSA and um, AES um, have been vetted by you know, tens or hundreds of cryptographers and there's not actually that many people in the world that are qualified to create encryption algorithms. Um, so yeah, don't use your own ones. If you do choose an encryption algorithm, make sure it's something that's modern um, and not out of date just by googling like weaknesses in and then the name of the algorithm. Um, most encryption comes down to the security of the key that unlocks the data and so you protected one bit by encrypting it but now you've got a whole new problem of how do you protect the keys and that's actually a real pain in the ass because um, it's quite hard to store the keys securely in a way that an attacker could never get them. So that might be putting them in an HSM hardware security module or, um, I don't know, printing them out and putting them in a safe and never keeping them anywhere. Or it might just be file permissions, but you need to think about that. Um, there's a protocol called strict transport security. That's where your web server tells the browser, um, hey, uh, welcome to my website, uh, nice to meet you. Anytime you come back, always come back over HTTPS. And that means that if the user picks up their laptop and goes somewhere unsafe, they can't be tricked into going to http colon slash slash mybank.co.nz. They their browser remembers they're supposed to go to https. 
So that's a really good thing to turn on. And also key pinning where your browser remembers which key it actually connected to. Cool. Um, so uh, number seven is missing, missing access control. So that means that you need to check whether someone's got access to data like on the front end and the back end. Um, so uh, something that sometimes people do is they'll make sure the user's an administrator before showing them the admin section of the site but then forget to check that anyone that posts updates to the data is an administrator. It's like, well, they can't see that page, so they're unlikely to post data. So you just need to do it on every entran entrance to the page. Um, and you know, there's different ways you can do it, like you have users or roles, or um, maybe using a claims based, which seems to be a bit more popular these days. Um, and, and again, it's better to have a white list of people that are allowed to access something rather than a black list of the people that aren't just in case a new user comes along that's not on your backlist. Cool, so uh, number eight is cross-site request forgery. Um, this is where you're forcing a user's browser to make requests on behalf of them. So I try and do this justice, but I always find it hard to explain. So um, the fundamental problem with the web and the internet is that once you're logged into a website and you're given a cookie, it like just keeps working. It doesn't matter whether you've switched to a different tab in your browser and you've gone to like cutecatpictures.com. Um, if someone sends you a URL back to that website, you'll probably still be logged in. Um, and um, there's a whole bunch of like issues where you know one page can load images from another, uh, one site can load images from another site. Um, it can run load JavaScript from another site. It can post data. So you know you can go to one page and enter a comment, click post, and it goes to another page, another site, to to post the comment. So basically, the web security model is kind of broken, and it's really complicated, um, and it's hard to get your rep, your head around what the same origin policy rules are. Um, so cross-site request forgery is an example of where this happens. So uh, the user is has logged into the bank, mybank.co.nz. Um, they then uh, close that tab and go to something else. Maybe they go to cutecatpicks.com. Um, and um, cutecatpicks.com is run by an, our attacker. Should really come up with an easier name to say than that. Um, and our attacker um, just sends them a form, um, which is just like you know a form tag with an input field, say amount, uh, another input field that says from, amount, from account, uh, another field that says to account. Um, and then they put that on catpicks.com and if the user clicks submit on that form, it posts to mybank.co.nz and passes in the from amount, uh, the from account, the to account and the amount and the bank might just process that transaction. Um, that would be bad. So um, the basic problem here is the attacker is able to send commands for the user on the attacker's website that the user's browser can run against another website. Um, and the user doesn't even need to know this is happening because JavaScript can make requests. So if I'm able to send JavaScript on my site, I can get it to, to run against any other website on the internet in that user's browser. And because they're logged in, anything their browser does will be logged in when it accesses that website. So I don't know if I explained that very well. Um, that's the, uh, the short, concise version of what I just said in the last five minutes. Um, the way you defend against this is um, there's a couple of things. Um, actually, I'll show you a demo of it first. Uh, damn it. Um, so here's a really dumb web page that just lets me change my password. Um, so I'm logged in as the admin user, um, and I can type in a new password and repeat it and change my password. Um, so you've seen this pattern before. I mean, there's some obvious things missing, like it hasn't asked me to confirm my current password. Um, but what this site lets me do is, um, instead of posting it um, as fields, is just put the uh, new password in the URL, um, which means if I go to this URL, uh, my password gets changed. And so if I change it to one, two, three, and go to it, I get passwords did not match. You know, so like anyone that goes to that URL, if they're logged into this website, their password will change. So an attacker could just 
email someone a bit.ly link that points to this URL. Um, just send them an email that says, you know, like, um, I don't know, something like, um, I've found pictures of you naked or something. Um, and everyone's going to look at that because, geez, that would be really bad um, and embarrassing. Um, and then pass the link to the bit.ly link. And if the user's currently logged in to this website, their password will change. So that's kind of like the, the most simple example. So how could we defend against this? Well, what if every time you change a password, you had to put something in there that the attacker doesn't know? So the, the usual way of doing it is getting the user to enter the current password, but it could also be like a random value that the attacker wouldn't know, get them to submit that to the website. Um, and that's what I'm saying here is, um, first off, don't use the get um, method. You know, don't change any data on your server based on URLs. Um, get's supposed to be item potent. Um, and also include something unknown in the form. So most frameworks now include CSRF tokens, so you can search for that. And that's basically a random value that only works for the current user. Um, and the attacker doesn't know it, so they can't trick the user into going to a page. Um, here's how you do it in some different frameworks. So at Laravel, you can manually enter the CSRF field and it puts a hidden input field inside your form. Um, or you can use the helper class, which does it automatically. Um, Symfony also does it automatically when you create a form. Cool, so that was CSRF. Um, could expand on that in a future topic, perhaps. Um, so number nine is using vulnerable components. And this is really hard to fix. Because basically you have to keep track of everything your application uses, every library, every JavaScript library, every part of your infrastructure, and make sure that none of it is out of date. Um, and it's a really hard problem to catalog everything you use, especially when you're using frameworks like Node, which just download random stuff when you build your app. Um, so it's quite hard to catalog everything you use. Um, but ideally you'd do that, and then you'd follow the security bulletins for each of those products, and then patch them. Um, so you might want to like talk to your managers about, you know, even though we release this website today, we're going to have to keep updating jQuery on it over the next six years, even though there's no dev team working on that product. And we're going to have to test it each time we do it in case the new version breaks something. So there's like an ongoing cost to every app that you release. Um, there's a project called retire.js, which will scan your website directory looking for old JavaScript. Um, and there's a few other commercial products that do something similar. Um, the last one is unvalidated redirects. So this is where um, one website, like here, foo.com, after you log in, you get sent to the dashboard. Um, so if you sent someone this link, they'd go, well, that's a link to foo.com. I trust them. They'd probably click it. Um, but maybe this next URL parameter can be changed and instead of sending them to the dashboard, it sends them to a fake login page that says, your password was wrong, please re-enter it. So they go to the real login page, enter their username and password, get redirected to the fake one, oh, my password was wrong, they enter it again. Um, so um, allowing redirects to other websites is dangerous because it kind of exploits the trust that the user might have in your website. Um, and um, yeah, so that you might be able to redirect them to phishing sites or malware. Um, interestingly, Google allow this all the time because they're a search engine, their site links to other websites and they're like, oh, we're not going to fix this. Um, so any link that starts with google.com, like you can't really trust that it's Google at the other end of that link. Whew. Uh, so that was the OS top 10. Um, it was a pretty fast run through. Um, and I skipped over some of them, but hopefully we can do future talks on different topics at the user group or elsewhere. Um, before I end though, I want to do a little bit of a rant, which is uh, choosing a framework. So the great thing about being in IT is every time you do a new project, you get to choose new things um, and learn heaps of stuff. Um, so take that opportunity to choose something that's secure by default. Um, familiarize yourself with you know what the framework offers in the way of security. And then how you make sure you don't turn that off, um, and look for ones that will fix the common issues like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, because the modern web frameworks do, whereas the old ones don't. Um, and make it really hard for your developers to make mistakes, because it's really hard to look for every possible mistake, um, especially when the app all works correctly. 
Um, so uh, there is an OWASP project that aims to catalogue different web frameworks and what protections they have against different security issues. It's not comprehensive, unfortunately, um, but you can see that the newer frameworks have better protections than the older ones. Cool, so that's me. Um, hopefully you'll consider coming along to the OWASP Wellington chapter meetings. We have them every two months-ish. I'll probably be one in February. Um, and our aim is to try and focus on introductory kind of web security issues and, and help improve your knowledge around those areas. Um, the two things that you might want to go away and play with, Damn Vulnerable Web App and SQL Map, the links are there. Um, just be aware that you should only really do web security testing against websites that you control and own um, because downloading someone else's database is probably a felony or a crime depending on where you live. Uh, so, so just be aware that you know, like, it's it's better to download one of these test environments or do it on your work apps than it is to do it on another app. Cool. So with that, I will end. Thank you. <laughs>